glad that you're here to uh, share with us today our presentation for focus. The, I'm John Williams. This is Kathy Wilcox. Uh, we're both professors in the School of Education. Kathy is the director of our Master's in Reading program and is in charge of undergraduate reading minor as well. So that's her connection to reading. Um, I teach uh, primarily in the undergraduate program in the School of Education, history and philosophy of education, trends in education, and secondary content area reading, teaching secondary teachers, high school teachers and middle school teachers the importance of reading in their content area. So that's our connection to reading. The connection to the theme for this focus, imagining the word, um, is that throughout the history of education, reading has been the primary vehicle for education. When the Puritans came on the Mayflower and started the first schools and the first universities in the United States and the colonies, which were to become the United States, they had two purposes, reading and religion. That was the purpose of education in those early days in this country. And the purpose for having everybody become a reader was to uh, be able to read and interpret the Bible. So uh, uh, the word it was important to those Puritans that uh, everybody, all their children, uh, be able to read and interpret the Bible. So their first schools uh, had strong emphasis on literacy and reading. So that's our connection today to the, uh, the focus theme. And we want to uh, jump right in to uh, begin our presentation. Okay, so welcome once again. Um, our goals for today are just three pretty simple but complex goals. We're gonna explore college level students' preparation needed to understand informational and complex text. We're also going to suggest and actually have you practice some strategies to actively engage yourself in the reading process so we can deepen your comprehension of these kinds of informational text. And then we're going to also practice what good readers do to comprehend text. So those are our three goals today. So we're going to open up with just a few little statistics here related to um, college and career preparation and readiness to handle complex texts that we face every day as we either teach um, undergraduate students or that we're actually trying to grapple with the information ourselves as students, okay? So, let's start with this one. 67% of young adults with learning disabilities have enrolled in um, some sort of post-secondary educational experience, yet 24% who receive support for learning disabilities in high school actually share that information about their previous, about their disability within um, the college setting with professors or support personnel. So there's a real disconnect between the folks that are coming into our um, universities and also them feeling comfortable or confident to advocate for themselves. By 2020, it's estimated that there will be 3 million college-educated workers in the United States, but there will be a need for 15 million college-educated workers in the United States. In a recent um, NAEP, which is the National Assessment of Educational Progress. It's the um, assessment that students take across the whole United States, and it's representative students from each state take this one assessment. Within the 2015 version, only approximately 31% were deemed proficient in eighth grade reading. So that means there's about approximately 70, almost 70% of our students were not being proficient. And it's hard to imagine then, in a mere four short years from eighth grade to post-secondary situation, that these students would be prepared to handle the kind of complex text that all of you face every day. 
kind of linked to that um, is the 36% number. And uh, some of you may know that uh, the state of Michigan has instituted for people that want to become teachers a professional readiness exam. Only 36% of those that take the professional readiness exam pass, pass it on the first try. And um, those who do pass it, um, those 73% of students that use um, reading strategies uh, are successful compared to those who don't. In, uh, at <clears throat> Spring Arbor University, uh, the average ACT score is 21.6. And the ACT says a score of 22 uh, means that you are college ready. So we're right about the average. That means some of our students coming into Spring Arbor may not meet those college readiness scores that they say are necessary in reading, writing, math in order to be successful in college. So these are just some beginning statistics that may help you understand the need for being better readers. And so, as colleges attempt to recruit and retain ever widening groups of individuals to seek those um, post secondary situations, the needs of individuals, the cognitive, the academic, the social, the physical um, disabilities could become more prevalent. And also that these are often individuals that have lots of gaps perhaps in their background due to military service or perhaps that they had home and family obligations so they're kind of put aside attending college or perhaps they're, they're just arriving from other countries so there's some language deficits or um, differences and so there's a wide range there of um, individuals that are coming into post-secondary settings that we need to be sensitive about and help them be successful as they also are attempting to grapple with these complicated texts at times. And according to Timothy Shanahan, who's kind of like a guru in reading, he says that oftentimes, even if you're moving right from high school into a college setting, that students, even if they did very well in high school, they are just not prepared to handle the kind of rigor and the kind of complex reading that is expectation in a post-secondary setting. Most of us have had <clears throat> experience with fiction, and prior to the Common Core State Standards being implemented a couple of years ago, most of the reading in elementary school and even in high school um, was devoted to fiction or narrative type texts. And the Common Core State Standards calls for a more balanced reading approach, including informational text and deep reading of text to pull the meaning out for students. But most of us in our uh, K-12 experience have not had practice in using strategies to help us uh, pull that meaning out of complex texts. So we've all had experiences where <clears throat> we've read a passage and don't have a clue of what it meant. <laughs> Any of you have had that experience? <laughs> so uh, um, <clears throat> we need to to spend more time thinking about our thinking, realizing when we don't get it, and then look for some strategies to uh, um, prepare us to better uh, tackle those complex texts. So, who are today's college students in reference to um, Professor Williams' readiness to tackle these kinds of texts? and be aware that meaning is breaking down. So according to Harvey and Goodness, they, they did have four different categories. And see as I kind of review and go over these, that you can identify your, yourself in times that. And probably you're gonna say, I can fall within all of these categories at different times, depending again upon the text that you're encountering. So the first one is tacit readers. Tacit readers lack any awareness. When I used to work with young children, they would be the kind of kids that would just be awesome in word calling, but you would ask them, what did you read? And they said, I don't know. So that's a tacit kind of reader. So we've all probably felt that way before. I know I felt that way when I'm going through directions, when I'm putting together a bookcase or something, I can read it over and totally lost. Uh, 
the awareness leaders, they realize, they're, they're engaged cognitively, they realize that something is breaking down, but they don't know what to do. They, so they're totally lost. So they possess no kinds of um, fix up strategies or reading strategies that they can plug in to begin to make meaning again from the text. Show of hands, anybody kind of felt like that before? Thanks for being honest. Now, strategic leaders, though, they use a thinking and comprehension strategy. So they've got that little voice telling them something's going on here. I need to try something else to try to get back and get meaning because I'm, I'm struggling a little bit. So they're utilizing some of these strategies, and that's awesome. That's great. But reflective leaders um, apply strategies flexibly, which meaning that there's there's a variety of different strategies that can be used throughout the reading process, before, during, and after, and they're very mindful and very um, efficient in applying those strategies because they're just so reflective as they're simultaneously trying to get the top meaning from the text, but also trying to be mindful of their awareness of and understanding what the text is about. So we want all of our students to kind of fall into that last category because we know that they will be the most successful as they're tackling complex text. And reading is a complex task. We're not necessarily right, wired for reading. Uh, brain scientists say that it takes 17 different areas of the brain to be, become a good reader. So our job uh, is to get those areas of the brain firing, uh, connecting to our background knowledge, and uh, to uh, uh, demonstrate what's in it for you as uh, a reader, so you, you have a purpose um, for reading, and uh, what the things that make <coughs> reading easier uh, are displayed on this slide, that uh, uh, we have background knowledge that we can connect to, so as we look at a text, we need to be thinking about what we already know about the, the topic or the, uh, um, the chapter or the text that we're reading. Uh, if we can mark, write, or draw on the text, uh, that makes it easier uh, to pull the meaning out. And if we can talk to somebody about it, uh, that uh, during and after the reading, that increases the meaning as well. If we can hear somebody read the text out loud, either the teacher or a classmate, often that makes reading easier. And if we have specific strategies for visualizing, inferring, questioning, rereading, and other techniques, uh, that improves our ability to pull the meaning out as well. So that's what we want to focus on in uh, the rest of this uh, uh, presentation today. That uh, those strategies that we use before, during, and after reading, because as I mentioned earlier, uh, if you have those strategies to understand and remember what you read um, Seventy-three percent of students find that uh, that helps them to uh, be successful in uh, college. And that's a pretty powerful statistic when you think about it. So hopefully you're convinced about the power of using these strategies. And so <clears throat> as we're looking over, this is kind of uh, our thinking, our visualization of what good readers do when they're tackling complex text. And so we've titled this the proactive and strategic reading. Okay, by that, proactive means that um, I am not passive with the text, that I'm fully engaged, that I'm doing some planning, and I'm preparing to um, engage with the text before I'm even doing any reading. Okay, so that's the, the proactive. The strategic means that I'm implementing a variety of strategies before, during, and after to make meaning. And so let me give you an example. As I'm reading, 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 and all of a sudden, I'm monitoring my, my, my thinking, my comprehension, and everything's going well. But all of a sudden, I'm getting either some unknown vocabulary, feel like that before, or some sophisticated or technical knowledge that I do not have any background knowledge in. And so I, therefore, must adjust my reading rate and kind of slow it down. Maybe I might have to even pull in some other resources to kind of understand some other unknown vocabulary. But then I'm going, I'm doing 
doing very well and all of a sudden I can start skimming some parts because I already know this part, it's, in, it's not relevant to what my purpose is for the text, so I can kind of just skim that, kind of like, you know, when you're going through a phone book, I don't know if anybody uses phone books anymore, <laughs> but you're just skimming it to get the vital information that you need. So that mindfulness, that metacognitive component is just critical. So um, metacognition really, anybody ever heard of that term? Okay, and I love, I've actually, you know, it's a, it's a million dollar word, that's what I used to say with elementary students, but it's really, it's just thinking about your thinking. Um, and another wonderful uh, definition that I've heard defining that is that um, you're listening to that inner voice, and I really like that, because it's that inner voice that kind of tells you, yeah, I'm connecting with this, yeah, it's connecting with what I know, I understand, oh, I'm really, I'm going full speed ahead. So it's that mindfulness and that listening to that voice and being self-aware and then understanding what to do next is the critical part. Because initially, as we begin to practice some of these strategies, it's kind of like an athlete. It has to, it's very intentional and very mindful that, oh, I've got to do this now. But like any good athlete, eventually these strategies become skills. And therefore, you don't have to think about it so much. It's kind of like me when I'm trying to learn golf right now. It is still in the very much the strategy stage because it is not at the automaticity or the, the skill stage where I can just do it. And we want to move it to that because then we can, you know, we have more room in our brain to focus on the meaning as opposed to applying the text. Is that kind of making sense? So, all right. After previewing, then we want to predict. <coughs> Okay, yeah. These, when you think about these in our, in our thinking, each one of, think about each one of these visuals and the title, the previewing, the projecting, the purpose, the prominence, and the producing, it's really strategy categories, for lack of a better term, okay? And I kind of created a mnemonic, they all begin with P, as you know this, so it can help us as we're working through a complicated text to kind of a, a check off to make sure that we've done some previewing in advance. We're previewing the topic, we're reviewing the title, we're looking at those subheadings, we're looking at the pictures and the captions and trying to figure out perhaps what we think it's gonna be about. And then from there, it's a prediction stage where we're really thinking, okay, what do I know about this topic? And then making some prediction, okay? And we're gonna go into each one of these a little bit more in detail, but I'm just going over them right now. And then the purpose one is really the intentionality of once we've done our good work on our previewing and um, our prediction, we're gonna think about what is our purpose for doing this? And for those of us that are professors, we hopefully are being really transparent with our students and giving them that purpose. Um, I want you to read this because, okay? That helps the student with the purpose. Or for all of you that are kind of just assigned something without a lot of direction, it's that helping you turn your prediction then into a purpose because that will just make the text come alive for you as you try to um, understand your purpose at a deeper level as you read. And once you're doing that, an, an integral part is also the prominence. And prominence is nothing more than determining importance. And you're de determining the parts of the text that really help you with your purpose, okay? And then finally, after you're done, you have to do something with it. So that's the, produ the production stage where you have to talk about it, as Professor Williams mentioned, or um, share it in some sort of way because you doing work on it really makes it more meaningful and then you own it. Okay, so here, okay, we all are comfortable now. Now we're gonna have a little bit more engagement now that we've given you all this good background. These are, pop, these are titles from actual text that we pulled up, okay? The first one is not grass-fed, but at least pain-free. The second one is well-off nation's kids not the best off. The third one is deadly spider requires long courtships or else. And finally, lesson plan, no more homework. Wouldn't that be great? So, I'd like you to share with your, um, your neighbor, and hopefully everybody's kind of sitting nearby someone, just to kind of talk about the title of some of the passages, um, what you think perhaps it could be about, 
And then also share about your good background knowledge, how you were able to come up with that um, idea based upon your background experiences. Okay, so we'll give you a couple minutes here. Aren't you glad I said this to you? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the first one I think could either be a metaphor or it could be literal. So, uh, I don't know, I was kind of thinking. This one? Oh, I. We're not like. I mean, I mean, they're just trying to, like, yeah. right, so, because the thing is, it's bold, it's like, yeah, whatever, mm -hmm. yeah, um, as far as what, like, they could be talking about, though, uh, I mean, the deadly spider one, it just sounds like, because I've heard about a lot of, you know, like, women spider, or female spiders, that, like, you know, eat their, eat the male spider after everything, and so it's, it's probably something to do with, like, they mate for a long time, or else the female's gonna, like, eat the female spider, or whatever, so. So which one are you guys on now? Um, so just kind of bounce around. I'm trying to think of what, well, I mean, I'm just so I was kind of thinking of that one is like people trying to come to the way that they can teach kids without having to give them the word because they want to be inspired. So I was thinking maybe it's a sort of uh, some kind of new. Have you heard of the new like math? Uh, it's called, but it's like it's a new way of learning math. It's really stupid. It's supposed to be like more simple. It's really dumb. What is that about? Um, well, it's like this way of like going about solving math problems that's supposed to be more simple, but it's really not. Because like say like you're trying to subtract forty six from seventy five or something, and so yeah, first you have to like round the numbers and then like subtract the round and then like add up the numbers that you took away from the original so, hey, blah, 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 and like give the answer. What do you think that first one you was could about? literally just do like three uh, steps I think to get the answer. It has something to do with like animals and like the, the new trend right now is that you have like free range and grass fed animals that are like supposed the meat is supposed to be like really healthy for you. So I think this is an article about animals that are not grass fed, but at least pain free. So maybe they're being killed in like a humane way. So, so uh, what kind of knowledge did you have that led um, you to believe that? Probably my knowledge of uh, like agriculture and like the trend that people want, like not cage free, or they want cage free food and grass-fed animals, so I think that's the trend, so maybe that's what that article is about. Ariana, I want to pick her you now. <laughs> no. Okay, what about the second one? Well-off nations, kids, not the best off. Oh, we talked about that one, and we kind of thought like it was referring to education, um, but like how nations that seem like they're well-off, their kids aren't necessarily being educated to the best of their ability. And what in your background gave you that idea? I don't have an education student. <laughs> <laughs> that makes sense. All right. Thank you. Anybody have a different opinion about that second one? Okay. Yep. Yep. Um, even though I have an education background as well, I took it as um, maybe e e even if if you're poor, if you're not well off, you still may have, um, there still may be benefits to that as opposed to being like brought up in a wealthy environment. Yes. And also with that, like, um, students that are more wealthy, they still have a lot of different issues like suicide and drugs and mm. communication and things. Yeah. Like, that's also a way to protect them. Yeah. So then, uh, okay. wow. What led you to think that? Because I've done research about it. Okay. And I'm also just not. All right. Okay. okay. Well, we are actually going to read that article in just a couple minutes. So hold that good thing. What about number three there? <clears throat> What did, what did you think about number three there? What did you think that was going to be about? I couldn't figure that one out. Julie said that maybe it has to do with an actual spider. Yeah, I uh, saw Blackwell spider brown with his spider who does this kind of thing. Okay. So um, you really didn't have 
enough background knowledge to no. to judge what that was going to be about, but you guessed it might be because you knew something about spiders. Yeah, because I fly close to my by the heads of their husbands. Uh -huh. Okay. Any science books? Anybody else? Science. What about that last one? What do you think that's going to be about? Somebody from the back row back there. What, what did you think it was going to be? I thought it might be about a flipped classroom. You ever heard about flipped classrooms where you watch a video at home and you do the homework in class? So uh, I thought maybe that's what it was going to be about. Well, even though I only gave you the topics, the titles, please know that this idea of previewing, as I mentioned previously, looks at the captions, of the subheadings. Sometimes a really neat way of doing that is taking um, titles that are a little bit uh, more complex and kind of simplifying them and putting them in their own words, okay? Or taking those subheadings or captions and restating them in your own words. So again, you're doing some work on it, so it's gonna be much more meaningful as you're reading it, because you have a deeper level of awareness about it. Um, you're also, um, previewing involves looking at the text structure. And when I say that, um, as you get it, looking through, you, especially across the content areas, you're gonna see some that are more cause and effect, often in science, courses and readings, or you may have some that are comparing and contrasting, okay? Or maybe one that tends to be a little bit more problem and solution, such as in mathematics, or even sequential, like in a history class, you know, it's a series of events. So knowing the structure of the text also helps you as you're previewing it and beginning to get ready to actually do the reading on it. Another important thing to preview is on any unknown vocabulary that you see. So making sure that you're circling or highlighting, you're doing some work on that text, either by trying to attempt to reading it around the sentences around that to figuring out, or even using an outside resource can really help you, especially in some of these technical terms that we may just need to look up in advance. Okay, now we're gonna actually dig into that article well-off nation's kids not the best off. So when I hand, hand you the article, if you would cover up the primary text and just we're just going to focus on the, the title and the subtitle first. want you to focus on. You can uh, maybe write off to the side. Um, on mine, I put, I think they might be talking about health, maybe obesity. Well, mine are is, our kids healthy? Yeah. I was going to share mine also. I said, why is the wealthiest one, the, one of the wealthiest countries in the world do such a lousy job bringing my children? <laughs> I just, that was the first thing that occurred to me because it was just seemed to be posed that way. So I'm really curious to read that. So then you want to ask yourself, what do you want to find out? Um, I put on mine. I want to find out what they mean by best off and who ranks first. And I think the author wants me to know 
why am we're at the bottom. So by previewing, we can make some predictions on what we think the article is going to be about. And we did that a little earlier. We, Ariana thought it was going to be about education. Uh, I said I thought it was going to be about health. Any others? I might agree with you about the health. I think maybe it's about stress, how stressed the kids are. Maybe you have to sometimes like emotional or social relations. Maybe in other countries the kids are happier because maybe they have better relationships and close relationships with their family and friends. Good, good thought. Yeah. I think it would help if we if you looked up the acronym UNICEF and see what that stands for. Okay. That would help determine yeah. what the article might be about. Good. Well, and the source is always important. Excellent. Good question. So. By previewing and predicting, um, that can help us determine our purpose for reading the text. All right, so we're getting into kind of the heart now of you establishing why you want to read this. So it's about agency and metacognition, a couple of big ideas that I mentioned earlier. So as I just like to show my hand, just yell it out. Um, what interferes with your ability to understand text in your life surroundings? We've kind of been talking about what help, what interferes with your focus and reading? Distraction. Distraction. Can we even be more specific? The internet. The internet. It's just, <laughs> the social media is like pulling you, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. What else? Boredom. Boredom? Mm -hmm. Okay. Not full engaged. Good. Mm -hmm. side. Yeah. So something along the lines of that, like thinking about like ways I could make better use of my time. <laughs> Feeling pulled to accomplish other things. Excellent. Great ideas. Absolutely. And there's so many more. And so we want to do our level best to maintain that laser focus because it's so easily we be distracted, right? And so how we do that is by setting up our purpose. And so um, previewing a text, just like um, Professor um, Williams mentioned, helps establish a purpose for reading and supports focus. Okay, so it's twofold. So questions for supporting personal purpose support your agency. Anybody ever heard of this idea of agency? I'm not talking about a business, but like personal agency. What's in it for you? Yeah. And so that helps you determine what's in this for me. Why should I read this? And also, uh, to, to follow up with that comment, it's also about the fact that you are active participants in your life. You're not bystanders sitting passively by. You, by being actively engaged, you have a sense of control. And that's what we all want in our life. And so feeling that sense of control then can really help one with our focus while reading. Okay? So that agency is critical. So when we're en engaged, we are also reflecting upon then what is my interest level on in this topic? What do I want to find out about this topic? And what does the author want me to know? So I'm going to show you a little clip now. Kind and of we're going to focus, we're going to tell you to focus on this video and uh, see who can get the correct number. This is an awareness test. How many passes does the team in white make? Go! The answer is 13. How many got it? I couldn't but see it. Did you see the moonwalking bear? Yes. I knew that was going to be. No! Okay. 
How many of you did not see it the first time? <laughs> I didn't see it the first time. Either. The lighting's not great because yeah, it was right, kind of hard to see, see, I know, right now. But, okay, once you had that idea about that moonwalking bear, it's almost like you couldn't help yourself but see it the second time. Anybody have that experience also? That's what purpose does. It's almost like it explodes off the page. That's what I used to tell my students. It literally will pop off the page to you. Once you have that intentionality and that focus, you can't help but see it. So to that end, you have another article. It's called The House in Front of You. If you could just briefly read that over right now in the next couple minutes, and then we'll come back together. So who do you think is telling this story? Whose perspective is telling the story? Mark. Mark. Mark is telling the story about it. And just in a nutshell, what's the gist of this? So this time though, you just read it as kind of a blank slate, right? We didn't do any reading strategies or nothing, we just read it. This time now, I would like you to pretend that you're a real estate agent. And thinking from that perspective, what kinds of things would you want to attend to within that class? So we'll just give you a little, maybe one minute to kind of review it from the real estate perspective, uh, realtor's perspective. And then Some of you are underlying the focus on important events. So how did that change how you read the article? Well, yeah. You look more at like the features of the house and like uh, what the house has. So well, different things are important. Let's look at it from another perspective. So if you're 
a burglar and looking to rob that house, read it again. elements jumped out to you this time, reading it from the robber perspective. Yes. The side door that's always open and the house is hid from the road. Excellent. Yes. Or all the cool stuff is stored. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Anyone else? Talk about how those different perspectives influence how you read it. Like you said, it's no longer a story. You're more now just making a list of everything that you think should be done. Mm -hmm. Get your list, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Take out of the home. Good. Yeah. Also, that the mother's never home on Thursdays. <laughs> Good to know. <laughs> okay, so purpose is very important in, in reading. And uh, um, specificity is important as well. So um, take a look at this title. Brain test may help diagnosis. Tool could reveal unseen damage to traumatic injuries. Now, there are five purpose statements here. Uh, evaluate those five and rank order them with one being very specific and reasonable, useful, to five being very specific, reasonable, and useful. Not one being not very, and one and a five being very specific. Rank order one through five. Five being the most useful. And one being very vague. And even though there's five of these, there's not going to be, we're not sequencing them up. We just rank each one individually. to learn what injuries can be seen from doing the, this brain test. Would you rank that a one or a five? Ari says five. Well, okay. so that's pretty specific. Yeah. I'm reading to know what this article is about. A one. I hope to learn something new today. One, about the different kinds of brain tests. <laughs> Not a complete sentence, but, <laughs> but uh, more specific than the others. Mm -hmm. To learn how brain testing can actually give you a diagnosis. Five. So what your what would be your specific purpose for reading that text? I guess it depends on why I'm reading it. Like, is it for assignment? Is it for fun? Yeah. Am I a medical yep. student? Yep. Do I care about this issue? 
That's exactly. That's yeah. that's what you, you determine. Mm -hmm. Like I was telling um, Professor Wayne's I was preparing, my mom had um, Alzheimer's and she just passed a couple of years ago. And so how I'm looking at that and reading is quite different than others because you know, was there a traumatic event that caused this? And if so, is there a test that could show that? And if, furthermore, do I even want to test myself though? I mean, I don't know. So and those are those kinds of questions that are going on in my mind as I read this. Okay. Now we as we're accessing and making meaning to the text, we've got our purpose here. It's always we're mindful of our purpose, but now we're at the next stage of strategies of determining importance. Because what we determine is important is what will help us with our purpose. And I saw many of you doing that as you were highlighting and underlining and circling within that previous the house text because as you had a different purpose, you were trying to highlight what was important related to that purpose. Okay, so we kind of walked through many of these um, uh, very critical strategies as we're attempting to um, determine what is important. University of Michigan, though, has identified <coughs> determinants determining importance as under two headings. And the first one is the elaboration of the text. And we're going to spend a little time with actually practicing some of those strategies related to that elaborating of the text. And also organizational strategy. And we're going to spend some time on what that looks like because all of these different techniques are under this idea of what's important in the text, what do I need to pay attention to to help me with my purpose statement. As we get into um, reading the actual text, um, some of the things, some of the strategies we're going to talk about are uh, annotating texts. And whatever approach you select um, is hopefully going to help you retain the information and it involves a conversation with the author. Think about it as uh, what the author wants, asking yourself what the author wants me to take away from this reading and uh, he's telling me here this and then writing off to the side some of you use sticky notes if some of you might use uh, if you can't write in the text you use a sticky note or you use a uh, Cornell notes format or you uh, uh, use some kind of coding format we're going to talk about each of those to make the connection uh, with what the author uh, want you to know and then what your background knowledge tells you is important about that text. So um, the first thing we're going to talk about is marginal notes and that's basically writing in the margin or using a sticky note, reacting and summarizing the main points in the margins. Then we're going to talk about text coding and uh, then sketching through text. Some people like to draw pictures. I tend to do that sometimes, either in the margin or in my notes. They help me uh, connect it in a different way, and that's a different pathway into the brain. So uh, oftentimes using pictures can help. And then uh, a note-taking format that works for you is, is important as well, as well as perhaps a graphic organizer. Okay, so let's start with margin notes. And I kind of started, um, we're going to, everyone has this article, and you've determined your purpose already. You've kind of yes. put that on top and you set that aside. The well foundation. No. The well foundation yeah. article. Yes. Okay, so just to refresh, what, my purpose statement was would one of the wealthiest countries in the world be such a terrible job to bring out children? So therefore, I would ask you then to read the first paragraph here, okay? And you can use sticky notes, and you can write on this, whatever your pleasure. And your, some of your thoughts, your reactions, your opinions, or any further questions that you have regarding just the first paragraph. And then we're going to stop and share some of these out.
see somebody who's an underliner like I am. <laughs> or highlighter. <laughs> So what did you underline? Um, the purpose of this article is to show. I underline like the important things. Who was the best, and what material materials were used to write these things. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's what I highlighted as well. The Netherlands was the best, mm -hmm. and then the uh, the six categories. Um, anybody else? I uh, underlined those same things as well, but not only the Netherlands, but Sweden and Denmark, and, and the side I wrote, what do they have that we don't, and so what can we learn from them? Good right. question. So, yeah, absolutely. Write a, write a question in the margin. Yes. I just underlined worst places to be a child among 21 wealthy nations, mm -hmm. and on the side I wrote some questions, uh, like how do they determine this? Um, mm -hmm. These categories seem to be very qualitative, mm -hmm. and how did they quantitate them? Like, what makes Netherlands better at behaviors and risks mm -hmm. than the United States, mm -hmm. and how do they determine that? Exactly. And I had a similar question too. How do they even define a child? I was not really clear of the age of. Bracketed then and wrote Nordic because they're all in the same region as you know. Excellent. Good insight. Yeah, I read the first sentence about the United States and I read here in the worst places uh, to be a child on um, 21 multi nations. I was thinking, say what? Because I was thinking from the special ed professional's mm -hmm. perspective where those two countries are like the best if you're a special needs child, which I actually am, I, I function autistic. But then when I was looking at the six categories, I could see, yeah, I could see how we're maybe not so good in ways to show behaviors. And the rest again, the Denmark and the Netherlands, um, they kind of made sense to me because I had heard about Denmark being ranked the happiest country in the world. Excellent. Well, well, let's move on because we're yep. approaching the end of our time. <laughs> so, next, yeah. Is the code, anyone ever use any of the text coding right here? Excellent. Now, um, these are some from a text, but you can certainly create your own. So, in the next paragraph right now, using these as examples, try to plug in a couple of these um, predictions or uh, contradictions, be able to visualize any of these elements that will help you again reinforce what's important within the second paragraph. I tend to use the question mark and the exclamation point yeah. and sometimes the star. Mm Someone like to share what they coded? Did you put a, a code by anything? Hey? Uh, I underline less spending on social programs. I'm putting an exclamation point there. Mm -hmm. I think after looking at a lot of these, I noticed that a lot of the top countries seem to have like universal health care. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How that relates to 
How about they're doing hospitals or things? That's what I had, Abe. I underlined that exact statement too because I did the Chuck Club about the prediction because it kind of connected with my concern about, you know, the wealth somehow is an inverse relationship between the quality of life or fit. Anybody else? Yes? I think Sam takes into those putting less time with your children. Does that mean you can add? Okay. So you kind of created your own little yeah. code. A, a similar, to, similar to coding, you can um, sketch throughout the text as well. If it's a text you can write on, like an article, or um, if you're taking notes, in addition to writing things, you could draw a picture, stick figure, or happy face or sad face, or uh, um, those kind of uh, drawings that help you remember the key things that are important to you, the things that that uh, uh, you supported or agreed with or disagreed with or things you uh, uh, want to remember. And I was going to also mention the fact that online technology with PDFs and such, they allow some of these highlighting and obviously bubble comments. It's just not the same exactly how we're you know, embedded in our brain and able to recall, but it's certainly available in online resources as well. So as you read the rest of the article, um, think of some type of picture or sketch that you could uh, put on there that would uh, solidify the meaning for you. How many of you use a two-column note format? Format. Anybody? You know, we uh, we recommend that in Core 100 uh, using the Cornell Note situation, where you, on the left side you take your notes, and on the right side is where you can ask yourself questions and uh, record your metacognition, your thinking, uh, what the author is telling you. Uh, what stood out to you. Uh, you can draw pictures there as well um, to keep things uh, connecting with that area of your brain so you can recall it better. Uh, your reaction, your thoughts, your questions are important to uh, uh, remember and record in some way. So whether you're listening to a lecture or reading a text, uh, a uh, note-taking system is important. And finally, this falls under the organizational uh, approach with um, determining importance that you have mentioned earlier, that a couple different ways to think about this is that either you come in holding and um, using a graphic organizer as you access text for a variety of purposes, such as like with the Venn diagram, that would lend itself very nicely with a compare and contrast kind of text structure to record your thinking so you can recall it and make it more memorable and therefore your own. Or what's a really neat idea for those of us that want to have diverse thinking and how people are processing and determining importance is to ask students to just sketch it out using their own um, graphic organizer of the text so, and then to have a conversation with your colleagues and your peers about how they um, determine the importance and how they graphically represent it. Representative text graphically could be very powerful as well. Often that uh, makes the meaning more personal than if the uh, professor or the teacher gives you a graphic or organizer where you fill in the blanks. Uh, that's usually less memorable than something you construct yourself. So that's a good idea. Well, we're at the end of our time. So as we close, um, we wanted to talk about. Publicity, doing something with the information. So what helps make your learning come alive and memorable as you finish reading something? What supports your retention and ownership of uh, an article that you read? What do you need to do? What makes it more meaningful? Not doing a diorama, right? 
Yes. Being able to relate to previous learning. Like I've been in a, I'm in a class and I'm reading something and I can recognize, oh, we learned about this last week, then I can remember it better. Or How am I going to use it? Yeah, or I can relate it to my own personal experience. That helps me. Perfect, making those connections. What else? Discussing overall is such a powerful tool to help you just solidify your understanding and even maybe clear up some misconceptions that you may have that your peer they can help you sort it out. But just having conversations is critical about the time. Harry Wong says learning is a social activity. So you need to be able to discuss what you thought about the article, the chapter, what questions you might have uh, to help solidify that by talking it out with uh, your roommate, your friend, another person in the class. Well, thank you so much for being such an engaging audience and willing to participate. We just, we're just really encouraging you to perhaps try some of these strategies and some of the complex texts that I know that you have assigned in every course that you're taking here. And so thank you once again, and just enjoy the rest of the afternoon.